Hi folks, Pastor Dave Grisham here for God and Country Ministries. And today, my message is on Christmas morning. And uh, my message today is, is Christmas Pagan. Now, my brother in Christ, Rich Pekoski, he did a very lengthy expose about this. And this is going to be a little bit shorter than that. He, he went into a lot more details. So if you really want to see all the historical details and stuff like that, you might go to his YouTube channels, Warrior for Christ, and take a look at that. It's very, it's a lot more in-depth. I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief summary of this so that you can have some arguments, and I'm going to bring up some things that he didn't talk about in his video. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, and we appreciate anybody that donates any amount, small or large, thank you very much. God bless you guys for your ministry donations, because you help me go all over the United States and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're about to go to Las Vegas and preach the gospel there on New Year's Eve and there's to hundreds of thousands of people. So um, please, if you can donate for that, we'd appreciate it. My donation uh, deal is my cash app. is dollar sign for God and Country Dave. That's F-O-R, not the number four. Dollar sign for God and Country Dave. And I'd appreciate it if you would help us out. Also, hit the like button and the subscribe and subscribe to this channel. And follow us. Hit the notification so you'll know when I put more videos out. In any case, today I wanted to talk about um, why Christmas is not pagan. Okay, now first of all, I want to say this. If you believe Christmas is pagan, you don't celebrate Christmas, that's fine. I'm not here to tell you that you're going to go to hell for believing that. Okay, that's not the purpose of this video. Do not read into that. Do not read that message into this video. I am not saying you're going to go to hell if you believe Christmas is pagan. I believe you're in error, and I'm going to explain why on a lot of different levels. But I do not, I'm not going to say that somebody's going to go to hell for celebrating the birth of Christ or not celebrating the birth of Christ. The fact of the matter is, the Bible doesn't teach uh, to, for us to celebrate the birth of Christ and doesn't teach us not to celebrate the birth of Christ. So if you want to, great. Knock yourself out. If you don't want to, great. Find something else to do on December 25th. You know, it's a lot of things you can do, okay? Every day, though, should be dedicated to the glory of Jesus Christ. Every day, whether it's December 25th or not, okay? So, the first thing I wanted to say, wanted to address, is some of the common misconceptions about Christmas being pagan. And uh, there are several different things, uh, one is that it's about the, um, that Christmas is actually uh, based on the winter solstice. No, nope, not true. The winter solstice is on the 20th or the 21st every year of December. It is never, I repeat, never on December 25th. So all you got to do is look at a calendar and you can blow that one right out of the water. There is no celebration of winter solstice associated with December 25th. So Christmas is not about that. It's not, it's not, it doesn't originate with that. It doesn't have anything to do with the winter solstice, okay? Number two is they say it's the birthday of Nimrod. Uh, first of all, the only historical evidence we have, the only historical reference we have for Nimrod even existing as an individual is in the Bible. And if it's not in the Bible, then it is simply a secular thing that is pure speculation, okay? The original story of Nimrod is contained in the Bible, and that's the only thing that we know about him that we can, we can rely on is what's in the Bible. And it doesn't say anything about when he was born, and it also said, it doesn't say anything about him ever being worshipped. So there is no historical evidence to suggest that Nimrod was worshipped as a deity, and there is no historical evidence whatsoever that Nimrod was born on December 25th. None whatsoever, okay? I will, however, give you some biblical evidence on why Jesus could have been born on December 25th here in just a minute. Um, another thing is that uh, they consider it Saturnalia. No, Saturnalia, I'm afraid, is so the 17th through the 23rd of December. So again, according to the calendar, it is not Saturnalia. Saturnalia is the 17th through the 23rd. It is never on the 25th, okay? So, 
Where did the early church get this? Oh, I'm sorry. Another another misconception is that it's all Catholicism, that the Catholics invented Christmas. It's all about Catholicism. And first of all, not everything the Catholics do is wrong. Okay, the Catholics take communion. The Bible says to take communion. So we don't necessarily say that communion is wrong just because the Catholics did it long before the Protestant church. Okay, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. The Catholic Church came around in the year 325, in the early to mid portion of the 4th century. And the early Christians have been celebrating the birth of Jesus in December as far back as the 2nd century. Um, so it predates, it predates the Catholic Church. Now the word Christmas does come from Catholicism. It means Christ's Mass, which they had a Mass or a church service on Christmas Day, and that's generally how most Christians celebrated Christmas for many years, is they just went to church, you know? Nowadays, they're closing churches on Christmas this year because, oh, got to be with family, you know? Somehow, the holiday is supplanted going to church. Not sure that's the right thing to do, but in any case, that's originally what most Christians did in terms of celebrating Christmas is they went to church and they celebrated the birth of Christ. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Now, where did the early church get the idea of um, that Christmas was actually in December? Well, it comes from the Bible. There's one other misconception I want to clear up first, though, that a lot of people get from the Bible. It's a misconception they get from Scripture, and it's a one that a lot of Christians believe. And that is because the sheep were in the fields or pastures during the time when Jesus was born, when the angels gathered and told the shepherds in the fields that Jesus, the Messiah, was born, they take that to mean that it had to be spring. Because in the, in the winter, they'd all be in the barns. Uh, no. First of all, you need to look up a weather report on Jerusalem for today. If you look it up, you're going to find that I think today's weather report in Jerusalem is it's going to be a high in the low 60s and a low in the like low 50s or something like that, you know, low to mid 50s. Not exactly Alaska, okay? But let me explain to you how that actually testifies to the truth that the that the birth of Jesus was in the latter time of the year, not the earlier time. This is actually a misconception that people don't understand how they actually uh, did their sheep herds. When I lived in Alaska for four years, everybody knew that in the wintertime, the moose would come down into the valleys. And this is simply because the moose go into the high country. They go up into the mountains during the summer and they eat the vegetation up in the mountains. And then as the fall approaches and snow starts to fall at the higher elevations, as the snow gets deep, they start moving down the mountains until winter, they're down in the valleys or in the fields or pastures. The reason God designed this system is because this makes the most efficient way to feed the, uh, the moose. If the moose ate all the stuff in the valleys in the summer, then when winter came, they would run out of food in the valley and they'd all starve to death. So what God has done is he's designed a system that they could eat all the vegetation in the upper elevations in the summer and then work their way down the mountain to the valleys and save the valleys where the snow is the shallowest, where it's the easiest to get to the grass and easiest to get to the brush because the snow levels are lower and the temperatures are not as cold. They can reach, they can access that food in the lower elevations much easier. So God has designed this system to help feed the moose. And the moose follow this pattern every year. Well, the shepherds would have noticed this pattern as well because they lived outside all of the time. So they would have noticed this pattern and they would have emulated it. They would have thought that's a great idea because we can, eat, we can take our sheep to the higher elevations in the summertime when the heat is really bad in the valleys, and we can escape the, the summer heat, and we can go up into the mountains and feed our sheep on all that nice lush grass. And then as the winter comes and it gets colder and the snows begin at the higher elevations, we can move the sheep down the mountain, just like the, nat just like the wild animals do. And we can feed the sheep in the valleys, in the pastures and the fields in the winter. You see, 
And this would come after the harvest. You see what you would do, like say you were harvesting wheat. You'd plant your wheat in the spring, it would grow. In the summer, they'd water it and it would grow. And in the fall, you'd cut it and you harvest it. Well, then you'd have stubble left in the field. Well, sometime after that, you'd put animals on it so they could eat that stubble. And then next spring, you start it all over again. You plant it all over again. So it, this would make maximum use of the available stuff for your animals and your wheat. So you wouldn't want them in the, in the fields and pastures in the spring because then they'd be eating the wheat after you planted it, and that wouldn't be very good. So you would eat up your wheat crop. So you take them to the higher elevations in the summer and let them eat the wild grass and then let them work their way down the mountains as the weather gets colder and the snow starts coming. And then in the valleys, in the fields and pastures in the valleys, that's when they are, that's where they are in the winter. So it would make more sense that if the if the scriptures say that the sheep were in the valleys and or they were in the pastures and fields, that they were in the valleys, not in the mountains. Now, if it had said they were in the mountains, then you could understand, you could take that as a time of year, and you could see that. Uh, perhaps Jesus was born earlier in the year. So don't take that one scripture and run with it and think that Jesus had to be born in the spring or summer because the sheep were in the fields and pastures. No, they're in the fields and pastures at the lower levels in the winter. See, then in the, after the winter was over, when spring would come, that's when they would, see, because the, the sheep would get this really thick layer of wool for the winter to keep them warm, and that's what they would harvest for the sheep was the wool. And wool is very good insulator, and, it's, and the sheep can withstand a lot of cold. It's the snow that makes it difficult for them to eat because they have to get through the snow to eat the grass. So what they would do is they would shear the sheep in the spring and then take them up to the mountains and let them eat. And then at the end, they would be feeding in the winter and then in the spring. because They need the winter coat for the sheep to survive. They don't trim them in the winter. And then in the, in the spring, when the spring comes, that's when they shear them, and then they begin growing that coat all over again, starting up in the mountains. So you see, they emulated this pattern that the wild animals would do for their feeding. And so this actually indicates that the sheep were in the pastures, and it was later in the year, not, it was, not that it was early in the year. Okay? Hope I've cleared that up. Now, turning over to Luke chapter 1... We're going to trace back the early church's efforts to try to figure out when Jesus was born. And we're going to do that not through Jesus directly, but we're going to do it through John the Baptist. Because you see John the Baptist's birth, John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. So if you can figure out when John the Baptist was conceived, you can figure out when Jesus was conceived. And then when you know when Jesus was conceived, you just project nine months forward, a little math. Bingo, we've got exactly when Jesus was born, or thereabouts. We don't know the exact day, but thereabouts. Okay, so an angel came to visit Zacharias in Luke chapter 1, and it says here in verse, uh, what is this, verse 5? Yeah, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, okay, he was of the order of Abijah. If you go back to the Old Testament, look under the law. I'm not going to go back to that because that would just extend this video really long. He's of the eighth order. There were 24 orders of these priests. Now, some people say that they served a week, that they served seven days, then the next order came along. Some people say... They did it once a month and that their service was every other year because, you know, you had basically if they did once a month, then you had 12 months and there were 24 orders. So then they went, boom, they, it was two years. Then on the beginning of the third year, you served again. Some people say it was once a week. Well, if it's once a week, there's 24 orders. So therefore, you only have 24 weeks. That's only half the Jewish calendar half the Jewish calendar because then they have to start over and they would serve twice a year. Either way, the math on this works the same, okay? He was of the eighth order. So if he was of the eighth order and they were serving once a month, that means that he would be in the eighth month of the year when he was burning incense in the temple. 
that would put it around August, around August or September, okay? August or September, because the Jewish calendar is different than ours, so it doesn't exactly coincide exactly with the, with the Gregorian calendar. Yom Kippur happens to be in September, okay? So if Zacharias was serving in September, like August, September timeframe, John the Baptist could have been conceived after his service, which would have been right at Yom Kippur. Now, Yom Kippur is a Jewish holiday of repentance. This makes sense because John the Baptist being conceived during Yom Kippur would mean that his ministry had something to do with repentance. That's exactly what his ministry was all about. His ministry was repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance basically what the Apostle Paul preached in Acts 26, 20. So he basically introduced Jesus. Now, the new covenant was introduced by the same type of miracles, the old covenant. This was, the old covenant was by Elizabeth and, I mean, sorry, by Sarah and Abraham. That was the conception for the, the conception, so to speak, of the old covenant. Okay, the new covenant came in the fulfillment through uh, I, the son of promise, right? So uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Isaac, and Jacob. So it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Isaac was the son of promise. Christ is the son of promise for the new covenant, okay? Isaac was born of a miracle. John the Baptist was born of a miracle. Jacob actually formed the 12 tribes and he and he began Israel. They changed his name to Israel. So Christ came right after John the Baptist, just like Jacob came right after Isaac. So the, the old covenant was conceived by a miracle of a dead womb being resurrected from the dead, okay, with Abraham and Sarah. The same thing happened with the new covenant. There was a dead womb resurrected from the dead with Elizabeth. And John the Baptist was conceived during the Yom Kippur, which is a message of repentance because his ministry was a message of repentance. This all makes perfect sense. Okay, so at this point, you know that John the Baptist was conceived mm, uh, late, late August, early September, somewhere in that range, okay? Probably September. If you figure it eight weeks, or each time a week, they have to repeat it, so you go eight weeks from the middle of the month, so the end of June would put eight weeks forward, eight to ten weeks forward, which would put you at the end of August, early September, okay? So if it's a week, on the second set of service at that time, it will put it during then. However, if it's once a month, it still puts it there. Still, because he was the, the eighth order, and so he'd be in the eighth month, and after that, it would be around September when John the Baptist would be conceived. So however you look at it, whether the, order, the eighth order served a week or a month, generally speaking, you'd find it, it would be September, no matter how you work the math. It all works out, okay? So keeping that in mind, we'll move forward in Scripture, okay? Now, the angel came and announced the birth of John the Baptist, and of course we know the story that he struck, <laughs> he struck Zacharias mute because he basically said, you need to keep your mouth shut, keep your ears open because you ain't listening good enough because obviously you should know that if, we, if God did a miracle through Elizabeth, and, I mean through a uh, through Abraham and Sarah, then he could certainly do it through you and Elizabeth. The same type of miracle. It's not like you never heard about this, right? So, Zacharias was unable to speak, but then it says here, so in, in verse 23, so it was as the days of his service were completed, so whether it was a week or a month, okay, that he departed to his own house. So it means he wasn't at home, okay? He was not sleeping with his wife, okay, at this point. Her womb got opened while he was gone. 
And then he went home and he slept with his wife. Now, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. So, after his service was complete, it was right after. Okay? Then it says, um, and she hid herself for five months. Now, this is important because the next scripture talks about when, or the next we're going to talk about, the angel says, now in the sixth month, in verse 26, it says, on the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. So the angel comes in the sixth month, not the sixth month of the year. If you do this, now you're going to calculate it wrong. It's referring to the sixth month of Elizabeth's conception. How do we know that? Because a little further over in verse 36, uh, yeah, I'm in the wrong spot here. First, uh, here it is, verse 36. Now, uh, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. So we know that the angel's talking about the sixth month of the conception of John. So John is six months older than Jesus, so he was conceived six months prior to Jesus. So let's do the math. So if John the Baptist was conceived in conceived in September during Yom Kippur. That means that Jesus was conceived during the time of about March, March to April, somewhere or somewhere in that range. Now, what Jewish festival is during that time? Hmm. I'm going to say it's Passover. Yeah, Passover. So the Passover lamb was conceived possibly during Passover. So he was conceived during Passover and then he was crucified right about Passover. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, so if he was conceived during Passover, the Passover lamb was conceived, what's nine months later? Well, that would be December. Well, is there a Jewish holiday in December? Yes. It's called the Festival of Lights. And it takes place this year from December 18th to December 26th. December 25th falls right in that. So the light of the world could have been born during the Festival of Lights. And what signaled his birth? There was a star. A star. And it was a light. And the wise men followed it to find the Messiah. So this light appeared during the festival of lights to announce the birth of the light of the world. Now, doesn't that make sense? Why would people take a very Jewish story and claim that somehow figuring all this up you're actually celebrating a pagan thing? No. Why wouldn't you look at it from the, from the Jewish point of view? Why would you concentrate on looking at it from the pagan point of view? Well, I expect atheists to do it from the pagan point of view because they're not Christians, okay? They don't serve God. And a lot of the atheists are the ones that say, oh, Christmas, is, Jesus was born. It's all, he stole it from the pagans. First of all, the people of God did not steal anything from the pagans because the pagans don't own anything to begin with, okay? You can't steal something if it doesn't belong to them to start with, okay? Right? I mean, for instance, you say the, the Indians always stole this land from the Indians. Did it belong to the Indians or did it belong to God? The land in Israel belonged to the people of Israel, the Jewish people, because God gave it to them. God has told the rest of us just go be fruitful and multiply and scatter throughout the world. So we, you know, we didn't specifically give any land to us. You know, we just take it or whatever, we buy it. But in any case, 
The pagans don't have whole holidays. They don't have holy days. That's what that word means. It's holy day, and it makes the word holiday. It's two words put together. Pagans don't own any days. God, The God of the Bible created all days, and all the days belong to him. It's just like the LGBT. They stole. You know, I like to see the next person that says, well, you know, Christians stole Christmas from the pagans. Well, you know, the LGBT stole the rainbow from God. I'd like them to say that the next time they say that and see what they say about it. You see, the pagans, the ungodly people, are always stealing things from God. Well, they're thieves. They're liars and thieves. So they steal from God. The pagans stole any day they have as a so-called holiday. They stole it from God. It's not their day. It belongs to God. And if God tells you to celebrate a feast or a holiday on a certain day, it's not being stolen from any stinking pagan. You know, it's being reappropriated back to where it belongs. If Christians celebrate Christmas in December, even if it was a pagan holiday during that time, it originally belongs to the people of God. It doesn't belong to the pagans to begin with. Okay? So nobody's stealing anything from the pagans. The pagans have stolen what they've taken from God. Just like the LGBT have stolen the rainbow from God. Okay? So... This is how the early Christians calculated the birth of Christ. They went off the, the birth or the conception dates of John the Baptist and Jesus being conceived six months later. So this would put John the Baptist being conceived during the Yom Kippur, about repentance, makes sense. This would make Jesus conceived sometime around Passover, makes sense. And then he would be born during Hanukkah, which started in 138 BC, or the Festival of Lights this year. So it's the Festival of Lights. Uh, makes sense for the light of the world to be born during Festival of Lights, right? So why would we not go to the Jewish calendar and look at maybe why Jesus was born on that day, rather than looking at a bunch of garbage about the pagan stuff? Why would people do that? So, in any case, Jesus was Jesus was possibly born in December. I'm, I don't even know 100% for sure. I may be wrong on this, okay? We all have error. We could be calculating this wrong. But I don't see any evidence that this has anything to do. The original calculation of December 25th had nothing to do with pagan holidays. Because as I said, Saturnalia is, Dece is December 17th through the 23rd, so that doesn't fall on the 25th. The winter solstice is on the 20th or 21st every, every year, and so that doesn't fall on December 25th. And as far as Nimrod's birthday goes, uh, nobody knows when that is because nobody has any knowledge whatsoever of when he was born. Because the only actual script, only actual historical reference we have that's reliable is the Bible and doesn't say when Nimrod was born, and it doesn't say that he was ever worshipped as a deity to begin with. There's no historical evidence whatsoever to see, show that Nimrod was ever worshipped. So we have all these people that want to come out and say you shouldn't be celebrating Christmas at all. Well, we can't be pharisaical about this stuff. You can't turn something into a sin that's not specifically listed in Scripture as a sin. Okay? If you can't specifically point to a scripture that says a sin, it's not a sin. Okay? You don't get to judge. You don't get to God is the judge of what is and is not sin. And we don't get to just, we don't get to decide. We're not allowed to add to or take away from the scriptures. God's word is perfect. It doesn't need a bunch of Pharisees trying to figure out, you know, maybe what God left out and add their own two cents in. You know, and trust me, if they put in their own two cents worth, <laughs> It's, um, they're overpaid because it's, it's not worth two cents. But I just wanted to, I just wanted to make this video on Christmas Day telling you that Christmas is not pagan. If you want to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, feel free to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But let's make it about Jesus. You know, my problem is with Santa Claus. And the reason my problem is with Santa Claus is simply because of this. I, I go to the store and try this sometimes. Go to Walmart and look on the holiday aisle during the Christmas season. And 
Try to find something about Jesus on that aisle. Try to. See if what you find is not down on the bottom shelf, way down here at the bottom, off in some corner. And everything else is about snowflakes and reindeer and Santa Claus and Frosty the Snowman and all these other secular things. And Jesus is relegated to the bottom shelf. I'm sorry, but Jesus is not on the bottom shelf of my heart. And I don't think he needs to be on the bottom shelf of this holiday. I think Jesus Christ is the top shelf. This is the, he is the reason for this season. Otherwise, you're left with nothing but a festival of gluttony and greed. That's all you have left if you take Christ out of Christmas. And so I just would recommend to you, if you're going to celebrate Christmas, don't make it about some fictitious guy in a red suit. I know he's based on St. Nicholas, and St. Nicholas has been dead for centuries, and he didn't rise from the dead. He's still dead, okay? There's no reason to make the light of the world be about anything other than the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. And if we can't make this one holiday strictly about Jesus, how can we honestly say that the rest of the days of the year we make our lives strictly about Jesus? I just don't see how that's possible. If on the holiday, if we got to throw in the Easter bunny on Easter and Easter eggs, we got to do all that nonsense as a distraction away from the true meaning of the holiday, which is the resurrection of Christ. And if we have to take Santa Claus and stick him in the middle of everything, and you know, I mean, how would you ladies feel if um, if your husband took another woman out for your birthday? Would that upset you? Think how Jesus must feel when you celebrate his birthday with another man, a fictitious man called Santa Claus. doesn't even exist. I think that's a lot closer to idolatry than uh, a Christmas tree. So in any case, God bless you all on this Christmas day and um, peace and goodwill towards you as, all, as towards all men. And remember that the light of the world came into the world and that's why we celebrate this day. And we need to be celebrating it every day of our life by living our life as a light unto the world. To be a lesser light than him, but a light that reflects his nonetheless. So God bless you all. And remember, you can't spell Christmas without Christ. So I do not wish you a happy holidays, but I wish you a very merry Christmas. God bless you all. Oh no.